big with we got one big closer which we actually tried to freeze the room and i think we did freeze the room with yes. um edwin diaz at 17 yes. no one else wanted him so we did that which actually helped us you know plan out the rest of the thing and because of that our pitching is i don't like our starting pitchers that much i mean yes we had three top good ones but we actually bulked up on relievers because we didn't like our pitchers so much our starting pitchers we'll talk about relievers in a second but yeah that was my biggest regret also um the thing about catchers especially in a two catcher league is you know there's some sense of uh, the, the fact that there's a replacement level that the 30th catcher really stinks and when you're paying, you're not paying for the actual stats of a catcher. You're paying for the privilege not to draft the 30th best catcher. Mm. And the question is, what does the market want? How does it bump up? If you, if we pay $18 for Salvador Perez, that's fine as long as everybody else in the market is going a little bit higher than they should. Right? It, it matters what the rest of the room is doing. Problem is, we didn't get gauge that market premium correctly on the catchers. JT Ramuto went for 18. We paid 18 for Salvador Perez. Wilson Contreras, 14. Uh, next catcher, Yasmani Grandal, 7. Uh, so you can see that the market premium uh, was less than we paid. We paid oh, more. Will Smith at 11, by the way, too. Will Smith at 11, right. I would much rather have Will Smith at 11 or Grandal at 7 than the Salvador Perez at 18. Problem is that, you know, he came up and, you know, at that point we needed uh, some power and we had the money. So, you know, figured let's do that and hopefully somebody will go crazy on, on Will Smith and then it would make our numbers look well. Hard to gauge that. We did a poor job of gauging the market premium. We probably should have stuck to our intuition that the value would have come out of somebody like Grandal and Contreras somewhere in the middle. Uh, but I like our, our second catcher, Dalton Varsho, for $2. The reason why I like him is that he's not going to play catcher. He's going to play outfield. He's mm -hmm. going to have a lot more at-bats than almost anybody else in the catcher field. And it's all about the counting stats. So a uh, good $2 bid in the end, I thought. Yeah, yeah, I dig that as well. That's why I was – I don't think anyone – yeah. I was curious about Carson Kelly too just because I don't know how many at-bats he's going to lose. Maybe when Dalton Varsho does move to outfield, which I do think he's going to pretty quick, he should get some good uh, uh, some good time there. But I, I, I was actually very shocked that Grendahl didn't shoot up a little bit more. Yeah. Uh, when yeah. I saw that he was going at seven, I was like, wow, that just seems like – you know, with that team behind him, he always seems like he's kind of a guy that people are reaching for. Uh, so I thought that was really interesting. Same with Travis Darno, to be honest. I really thought he was going to exceed – 10 bucks maybe yeah. have you know yeah. after the season that he had last year uh, so that was a little surprising to me as well and what we what we actually tried to what we actually tried to do though is after we got Salvador Perez we actually started nominating catchers that we thought had an, a higher ADP than what we valued them so hopefully they would go higher but that didn't work out yeah yeah, listen, you, you know, you're going to get some things wrong. And it's not that he was the wrong player. He actually fits our team. Our team is actually light on power. We've got plenty of steals. We've got Kyle Lewis. Yeah. Uh, we've got uh, – who else we have? Dylan uh, Moore. Sorry. sorry, so not Kyle Lewis. We have Dylan Moore. Mm. Um, we have – um, uh, Tim Trent Anderson, Grisham. Trent mm -hmm. Grisham, Ramiel Tapia. We've got yeah. plenty of steals. Yeah. So Salvador Perez actually does fit our team for what we need in the end. But, uh, you know, just at the time, I didn't like the price. Uh, we weren't planning on going heavy in the middle infield, but the, the value just came there. Um, you know, we got a, a nice Tim Anderson early by um, – I think the big thing about Tim Anderson is that we brought him out earlier than Bichette, earlier than Lindor, earlier than uh, Whit Merrifield. And because he was brought out earlier, people probably didn't go the extra buck or two thinking, I'll just wait for one of those other guys who I like yeah. better anyways. Yeah. Uh, and that, that left Tim Anderson uh, uh, bargain for us, and that let us go a couple of extra bucks on uh, Xander Bogarts and really lock down some of those counting stats with him. Yeah, definitely. I thought that was a really wise strategy, and that is a fun way to do it. I mean, I, th I think that's actually one of my favorite parts about an auction is who am I going to nominate to screw over the other people the most? You know what I mean? And last year, my strategy was very, very much like I know people are going to spend on closers. Like I, it, it just it happens every year. So I, I actually think that was removed from me this year because there's such a wider knowledge of the volatility of the market. Uh, you know, when it comes to relievers this year, so I, I wasn't able to rely on that crutch quite as much. Right. So um, we're going to talk about relievers today, but uh, one thing that we did was we got four closers, four mm. closers on a 12-team team. If you do the math, you really only need about two or two and a half or three closers. We decided to go quantity over quality. We got the high up Edwin Diaz, mm -hmm. and then we went Rafael Montero, Anthony Bass, and Joaquin Soria for some cheap amounts, taking a couple of stabs. Um, 
you know, the, tonight we're, we're going to talk our strategy section about about closers, and uh, you know, I'll throw it out to you. I know that uh, you did a great presentation last year at at uh, right around this time of year at first mm-hmm. pitch about. Uh, Closers are terrible investment bargains. They are just money losers. How can we draft closers? So what, what is your general strategy of, of what you do in, in drafts or auctions? Yeah, you know, it's such a funny question. Like, obviously, you, you know, you came to that, and you, it was awesome to have you there. I, I think I – didn't I meet both of you then? Or, Reuven, did I meet you later at yeah. – uh, No, you met me – I was there. You met me was there, there, yeah. Because uh, yeah, I, I always get that and uh, the other event that I was uh, confused. Um I keep complaining like, okay, well, you know, the ideal thing is to go to a saves hold league. The ideal thing is to go to a saves hold league. And then I've gotten to tout and it was a saves hold league. And I was like, I don't know what the hell I'm doing. I got to really, I got to put my money where my mouth is. Um, I think usually what I do in leagues like this is if I try, I try and get the guy who either is the sure thing or is on a team where he's got people ahead of him who are elite enough that they're going to stay there and he's always going to maintain that closers role. Like one guy who actually comes to mind for me this year is Kenley Jansen, right? He's got so many fantastic relievers ahead of him that he he's like arguably not the actually unarguably not the best reliever on the LA Dodgers, right? So they're going to be able to use Blake Trinan, Bruce Dahl, Gratterall, Joe Kelly, maybe even Corey Kniebel, um, Victor Gonzalez as well in high leverage situations, leaving Kenley Jansen the ninth inning, right? So I think he's a guy that's valuable. Um, obviously, your Liam Hendricks is really valuable, but then there's a guy like Nick Anderson who's the polar opposite of a Kenley Jansen, right? When I see the best reliever on a team is in the ninth inning spot, then I'm like, okay, there's a good chance he might not be the saves leader. Because as you mentioned in that presentation, as we see year in and year out and year in and year out, saves are being more evenly distributed across the bullpen than ever before, right? I can't quite accurately look at the 2020 sample size and say that that continued because obviously it's way too small. But I can almost imagine that it's going to happen again because, I mean, you guys can correct me if I'm wrong. It feels like there is more there are more nebulous situations involved in bullpens this year really than ever before, right? Those guys that are the quote unquote lockdown capital C closers, they really feel like they're much more few and far between this year than ever before. Yeah, uh, no, no doubt. Um, You know, uh, what I've, what I've seen is that in, in general, and of course this year, as you said, is, is even, even worse this year, but the best investments come from, not the elite closers. We're not talking about like Hendricks at the very top or Hader, but the second tier that are locked down. So for me, it was uh, Iglesias and Diaz this year. Um, those are probably the ones that are going to be more locked down. Now, I think Edwin and Diaz ha- brings another dimension to the game because of the strikeouts. When mm-hmm. you're getting 100 plus strikeouts in a year, uh, which is almost like an SP4, uh, or, you know, so it, 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 it just saves you. From uh, having to pick these high strikeout guys, you can focus – if you have Diaz on your squad, you can focus on more ratios on your pitching staff and forget about strikeouts and it allows you to do that. Um, but the key in return on investment is you either want high return or you want low investment. The cheaper, cheaper, cheaper people to me are the way to go, especially in a 12-team yeah. mixed league. Um, so what we did is we, we picked you know three darts. We got Edwin Diaz who's going to lock it down. That's our base. And instead of trying to pay up for that middle tier, let's just throw some darts. Here's the other thing I will say. Um, Everyone says that closers and saves are volatile, but the truth of the matter is it's less volatile in the first month because usually there is a set closer, and he's not losing his job in the first week of the season. So if you have four guys who have the role to start, even if they stink and get thrown out half the way in the year, you're starting the year with saves. So if you're going to – you don't have to play two closers, three closers, four closers. You get a choice. If I had seven closers, I could play seven closers. I want to front-end the closers. I want to play more starting pitchers later on, more closers earlier. Because early in the season, I don't really know if starters are good. Right, I'd rather only play five starting pitchers who I know are solid rather than putting a sixth and a seventh for volume. Why do that earlier on? Pick a closer and throw in an extra closer or two who I know is going to get the save opportunity. And later on in the year, you can make up the innings by not having a closer. If one of your closers gets traded or one of your closers loses a job, so if you're down from four to three, 
You've already played it and used up his saves ability, and then you can stick an extra starter later on. And by the way, you'll know which teams have good lineups and bad lineups, and you can stream a lot better. It's easier to stream in July than it is in April. So you might as well play that to your advantage and set yourselves up to play closes earlier and more starters later. I will say, though, that does sound as if you're coming from predominantly a Roto standpoint, though, right? Yes, yes. For yes. Sure. That's, uh, so that's an important caveat, too, because I feel like if you are going from head to head, you might not have that luxury because theoretically those guys who are losing those jobs are technically doing so because they were in a, you know insufficient in that role. So you might have to spend a little bit more. I mean, I, it feels weird to even say that because I, de- I overall, I definitely agree with your take. Like, it's fine to take those lower guys. Like, usually the guys that I would target are the good closers on poor teams. You know what I mean? Like, before yeah. Joe Jimenez was really poor, there was a stretch where he was a really great get. You know, there was always a guy in the Kansas City Royals, you know, albeit last year, like last year you could have gotten, um, I think it was Rosenthal last year, right? Uh, yep. You could have gotten him or, you know, usually the um, there have been times where the Orioles have had really great closers, uh, you know, even though they haven't been a great team. Guys like the Pirates have had good closers. Um, so I also that's kind of like what I uh, why I like what you did with Anthony Bass. Like he's the perfect example of someone that people yeah. think like, oh, well, it's the Marlins. They're probably not going to win a lot of games. Why would I go ahead and get Anthony Bass if he maintains if he keeps that role? I mean, yeah, he could be he could be right. quite the steal for you. Well, that's that's what we're doing. We were actually at the toward the end of the draft. We were targeting these lower end team uh, pitch, uh, closers. We're looking for the Rich Rodriguez type. We're looking for the Anthony Bass type because you know what? Even they're they're gonna they have to get some wins. They are gonna get some saves if they get some saves, fifteen to twenty saves. That's great. And if the, and if one of these teams start out hot and they start out doing well, like the Royals did, I think on uh, in in two thousand nineteen, and and Shane Green racked up all these. I'm uh, not the Royals, the Tigers. He racked up all these saves in April. It just Build you such a huge buffer for right, for later in the season. Plus, Ariel, I want to add something to, with what you said. You want to return on investment. Well, I, I know one of the articles you wrote was that for Fab, one of the best returns on investments are picking up relief pitchers. Now, usually the turnover is probably going to be in May or June, and that's when you start seeing the turnover. But you know what? For those first two months, just like you said, you're going to be able to get those counting stats. Those if they lose, if the closers lose their jobs, you're not losing those saves. You may lose the the the, the player in that position, but you're not losing the saves, and it's a hundred percent worth it to just hold on to the named closers for opening day just for at least one or two months. Yeah. The thing about Fab is that closers are uh, are good investments on the waiver wire if you don't overspend on the waiver wire, right? Mm. If, if you're going to spend 15% of your budget on a closer – on the waiver wire, that does not become a good investment. If you only invest 5% of your budget on a closer, it becomes a good investment. So the trick is to see some potential closers somewhere in the middle of the season and float them in when either a closer is struggling or whatnot um, and get those guys on your squad cheaper a week earlier if you can, um, and, and then they become good investments. The, the, the waiver wire investments, I, I think, are, are the worst. Are the Oh, my God, they just brought up this prospect. Everybody grab him, yeah. and, and it goes in a frenzy. How many times did that turn to success? Yes, Juan Soto was a huge success. Absolutely. It doesn't happen as often as you think, and people waste an enormous amount of budget on them. Uh, fab is one of the better uh, – closers are one of the better uh, uh, investments on Fab that you can do. Um, so um, one question to you, Alex, is how much is a, a relief pitcher's ratios, what he does in terms of – uh, strikeouts, uh, sorry, uh, ERA and whip, and, and I'd say even strikeout ratio as well. How much of is it, are those numbers a concern for you when you're drafting, or are you really just almost all of it looking at what his closer role is and will he get a save? Um, for, usually, to be honest, it actually is the latter, but I think it's it's entirely contextual about how you're building your SP staff, right? If you're filling it with volatile pitchers who have really high ceilings but really low floors, I prefer to anchor that with guys who are going to be better ratio guys, right? So if you want to get like a Devin Williams in a saves hold league or if you want to get like a Liam Hendricks or even like an Edwin Diaz for the um, – uh, for the strikeouts, I think that gives you the opportunity to say, okay, you know what? I can actually afford a Tyler Molly. Um, I can actually afford, I don't know, like a um, maybe like an, I don't know, Eliezer Hernandez or someone who's got like a large floor, large ceiling as well. Uh, now, if you're in the opposite direction where, you know, you're, you're, 
drafting a little bit more conservatively than, or actually I should say, excuse me, if the SPs have a little bit better of a floor, I'm really just kind of getting those stats. I just want to gather as many saves as possible. So I really think it just kind of comes down to how you personally prefer to draft. 